It's time to move on to the first part of our session. Um, we, of course, know and love Clint Patterson, uh, recent uh, uh, recent uh, dad of, uh, of a one-year-old and, and counting who's, uh, who's keeping him awake at night. Uh, he's doing all of the work that he does for Dean and Corporate, all of the work that he does for Dean and Summit, uh, all the volunteering work that he does for community things, and he decides he has time to research a new technology and learn about it and give us a presentation. So that's, uh, uh, that's something that, uh, that deserves some accolades. So uh, here we go. Without further ado, we're going to scratch the surface with Blazor. That means I'll have to switch over. You presenter. should switch yeah. over presenter. <laughs> I talked and gave you the word. Yeah, and uh, I was busy trying to answer questions. All right, switch <laughs> presenter. Clint, did I send that to you or did I accidentally send it to Grandpa? Uh. I'm not. I'm I must have actually just sent it to Grandpa. Let me. Uh, well, Joe, he may want to present. <laughs> All right, there it is. All right, All right. okay, start sharing. All right, are y'all able to? Yes. Just Looks good. See my screen. All right, and can I minimize this? That's a scary iceberg. So what are we scratching here? The we're scratching the water the ice, or the, ice? the tip of the iceberg. Oh, the tip. Mm, okay. <coughs> that that <laughs> that's success above the water, and everything it takes to get to success underneath. You know what people don't see. So uh, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyways, welcome to the session here. We are the, the session title is scratching the surface with Blazor, and as we just alluded to, uh, this is going to be kind of a, a, a high level uh, review or overview of what uh, Blazor is. And to be honest with you, I am simply trying to. Uh, emulate a session that Dan Roth, who is on the uh, ASP.NET team, I think is actually a program manager, uh, he gave a talk, I think it was on Channel 9, and I'm just going to essentially try to re-give that talk and, you know, sprinkle in some uh, Southern wisdom in various places, right? <laughs> uh, so, but the question is, while we're going through this, I want you to think, you know, about, like, what is this new technology and what could it potentially mean uh, for DNN. So kind of keep that in mind as we go through. And I am Clint Patterson, as Ryan mentioned, Ecosystem Manager at DNN Corp. That is my Twitter handle, CBPSC. If you are asking yourself what is an Ecosystem Manager, uh, it's kind of like an evangelism or developer relation community style uh, role. I spent a lot of different boundaries, basically in between uh, the company and the open source community. All right, so a couple of notes before we get started. I, if you can believe it or not, am not a Blazor guru. Blazor has a client side and a server side story to tell, and you'll see that play out throughout the uh, presentation. And also, Blazor is still evolving. So uh, I put that in here so that you'll understand, you know, what you may see here tonight could be different in a couple of so still uh, working on it. So let's start out with what is Blazor? So this is a blob of text and I'm actually going to read it. So Blazor is an experimental .NET web framework using C Sharp Razor and HTML that runs in the browser with WebAssembly. Blazor provides all the benefits of a client-side web UI framework using .NET on the client and optionally on the server. It's a lot of words, but we need to kind of focus in on a couple of them, right? So experimental. I put experimental in quotations uh, because if you translate that, it's basically Microsoft saying, we don't want you to run this in production yet. But they're very much pushing uh, Blazor. Uh, also, when you think the next couple words, you know, running C Sharp Razor in the browser, that's also something that is, you know, new. Uh, and... The next sentence, it says that Blazor provides all the benefits of a client-side web UI framework. So let me ask you guys in here, or are you guys on the meeting, when you hear the term client-side web UI framework, what comes to mind? Yeah. Uh, the frameworks? Framework. <laughs> you got all, all kinds of them, right? Like them, yeah. Angular, React, jQuery, Vue, that kind of deal. And then the last... Uh, portion of that sentence using .NET on the client and optionally on the server. So you're probably familiar with hearing .NET on the server, but you don't hear people saying .NET on the client, right? So this is getting into kind of a new space here. So 
as you can see, we're talking about full stack web development with .NET, and that happens via WebAssembly. And there's no plugins required. That is, you don't have to install the Flash Player or you know any random plugin. Okay. So some people ask, where did the word or term Blazor come from? So we're talking about running Razor in the browser uh, with .NET Core. So you, you, you've got Blazor. yeah. So you so you've got Razor, and you're using WebAssembly to run it in the browser. So browser plus Razor equals Blazor. Now you're going to hear a lot of terms, Blazor, Razor, components, client, this and that, and we're going to do like a terminology review here at the end. So, but anyways, that is where the term Blazor came from. So why use Blazor? So uh, you do get a lot of uh, benefits and advantages. I won't read all of these sentences, but you've got stability and consistency, right? So, you know, you're used to programming in these standardized frameworks from Microsoft. You're used to them. Uh, they're stable, they're consistent, you're going to be able to, you know, continue using those uh, tools. Modern innovative languages, so they're constantly evolving and improving uh, the .NET languages, you know, you get that benefit. Industry leading tools, you'll be able to do this in Visual Studio uh, and continue to have the development experience that you're uh, accustomed to and you can do it across all these different platforms. Speed and scalability, I mean, you guys know this, .NET performance, it's reliable, it's secure, uh, but when you start using .NET as the full stack, then it gets a little bit easier to be more uh, reliable, more secure, and faster. And I kind of changed the color of this one. I don't know if you can see it too much, but to me, this is the biggest win, right? So it's full stack development. So your C Sharp developers will be able to leverage their current skill sets on the client now. So if you're somebody like Mitchell Sellers, he's rejoicing, right? He's like, oh, I can finally do stuff on the client, right? That is a big win, and you'll be able to use that code in the client or the server, and you can share that logic among apps. And then the last one is, you know, if you're using modern browsers, you'll have wide browser support. It, it, that was going to be my question. Yeah. Was how many browsers is it supported in? Is it yeah. on the edge or something? Yeah. Where so, so you'll see there's no plugins and there's no, uh, like, code transpilation that has to happen. It, it will just work. And you'll see that here uh, shortly. All right. So I put this on here because this is kind of what you start thinking, right? It'll make your ears perk. It was like, hold on. So you're telling me I don't have to learn all these JavaScript libraries, right? Uh, that is kind of where we're pointing to here. So uh, people ask the question, is Blazor the next Silverlight? And my response, no. You know, I was thinking about that. It's I a, was heavily it, working yeah, with Silverlight at one it's point. It's a valid yeah. question. We even had people ask that question, you know, when they were coming around at the Microsoft conference, right? They're like, what's this Blazor thing? You know, you guys are pushing it. Uh, should we invest time learning it? I don't want it to be silver light because, you know, these guys are, yeah. are pretty blunt. So anyway, it's a valid question to ask, right? But I, I'm here to tell you, at least from my perspective, that Microsoft is, uh, that Blazor is strategic for Microsoft. So uh, on the first bullet point here, imagine that you run uh, a technology company, for example, Microsoft, right? And you build tools. What if you could get your clients running your entire technology stack from database, you know, from the server to the client, right? I mean, that has to be a win for Microsoft, right? If I can get you using my stuff in your whole development process, there, there's nothing bad about that, right? Um, so also, looking at the signal. So we've got the cover of Code Magazine. I, I did put it in the PowerPoint. I brought my... Code magazine. Uh, if you notice, we they, they got Blazor on the cover. So that is a, is for some people not a big deal, right? But for others, it is a message, right? So it's like you know, reading the tea leaves or whatever it is. So that's one thing. Now, uh, you guys know that I went to Microsoft Ignite and I was working the open source booth. Well, the ASP.NET booth was right there beside us, and uh, guess what? They were demoing all week at Ignite. Blazor. Right? So they're promoting it. The team's, you know, kind of passionate about it. And then if you look at all the materials coming out from Microsoft, the .NET team, uh, there's a lot of updates around uh, Blazor being shared. Blazor has its own website, building up its own community, and we're going to look at that stuff. 
Uh, yeah, so I was saying they're already building open source contributions up around the project. And you can use Blazor with Electron in a lot of different uh, ways, and we'll, we'll talk about that. But the whole point here is I think Microsoft is really, uh, this Blazor is strategic for Microsoft. I think they're putting a lot of energy into it. I think it's going to open up a lot of possibilities. All right, so Blazor, the client side. How can .NET run in the browser? Anybody know? You know, you've already. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to go through some stuff here. So running .NET code inside the web browser is possible through WebAssembly, which abbreviated is WASM, WASM, right? So that's also a relatively new technology. WebAssembly can access the full functionality of the browser via JavaScript interrupt. A WebAssembly runs in the same sandbox as JavaScript, so that prevents, as I said, malicious uh, actions on the client machine. So when a Blazor app is built and run in a browser, the c -sharp code files and the Razor files are compiled into .NET assemblies. The assemblies and the .NET runtime are downloaded by the browser, and then Blazor uses JavaScript to bootstrap the .NET runtime, and, and we'll show that here in a little bit. It configures the runtime to load the required assembly references, and DOM manipulation and browser API calls are handled by the Blazor runtime via that JavaScript interop. So if you're asking yourself, well, what about an older browser, uh, if it's not mo modern, if you have to support older browsers? So WebAssembly, Blazor is going to fall back and use an ASM.js-based .NET runtime. So what is WebAssembly? WebAssembly is essentially bytecode for the web. It's intended to be used as a compilation target. And in this video, this is Dan Roth, the guy I was talking about, the ASP.NET uh, program manager. This is a still frame of the video where he's talking about um, Blazor, and he's showing the C Sharp and CS HTML, which is the Razor files, if you can't read that code, being compiled into .NET assemblies. And then he's got the browser, which will have your app name, whatever, DLL. And then you can see you've got .NET and the mono.wasm, which is the WebAssembly. It may be hard to see there, uh, but that's him talking through it. So they're using mono to make this happen. And what is mono? Mono is a WebAssembly implementation of the .NET runtime. So when we load up the project here in a little bit and we F12 and look into the console or the network tab, you'll see that mono.wasm, which again is the .NET runtime being loaded into the browser. So what does all this mean? It means you can leverage your existing .NET skills on the front end. You don't have to worry about the JavaScript flavor of the week. And like I said, the C Sharp developers around the world are rejoicing. All you have to do is find a video on YouTube about Blazor and look at the comments. They're like, it doesn't matter if it's ready, just ship it. You know, we love it. <laughs> we'll deal with the fallout. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Because they feel like they'll be able to catch up with the JavaScript developers, right? Like they don't have to learn all this, you know, JavaScript frameworks. They can just use their skills. So you will be able to debug in the browser, uh, but that is currently a little bit flaky as they, they note. Uh, they're still working on that. All right, so let's talk about how this kind of works. So Blazor components. So Blazor apps are built with components, and as we go through this, you may have the same feelings that I did, which to me, it feels very Angular-ish, if you've ever dealt with Angular. It also feels kind of modular-ish to me, in the sense of a DNN module, perhaps. Um, so a component is a piece of UI such as a page, dialog, or data entry form. Uh, it could be anything you can imagine on a website, right? It could just be injecting some type of service if you wanted to. Components can be nested, reused, and shared between projects. So in Blazor, a component is a .NET class, and those classes can be either .CS files or .CSHTML. So it can be a class or a Razor markup page. So, a little review. Components can be nested, created with Razor or C Sharp. They can be shared via class libraries, and they can be unit tested without requiring a browser DOM. So, Blazor infrastructure. 
So Blazor is going to offer you these core facilities that most apps require and similar to these JavaScript frameworks that we mentioned, you're going to get layouts, you're going to get routing, you're going to get dependency injection, uh, and all of these features are optional. So if you're not using any of them, uh, then the implementation is going to remove them so that you'll have a good performance uh, or that you will get good performance out of the application, right? So we talked about JavaScript interop uh, or interop. If you still need to interface or integrate, like let's say you still need to use jQuery or whatever, you can still do that. WebAssembly is designed to be able to interoperate with JavaScript, and that's actually how it bootstraps the applications. Uh, so you can call any library or API that JavaScript can call, and then this one should kind of get your mind spinning a little bit, right? So C-sharp code, go ahead. Full library C-sharp code, sub-library C-sharp code, only some things run in this, some things don't yet. What's, what's the idea there of what you can and can't do? Is it a... No, so what it's saying is, with C Sharp, you can call into JavaScript code, mm -hmm. or with JavaScript code, you can call into C Sharp. So let's just say you're coding in some Razor function or something, and then you need something that currently is not possible inside of C Sharp to happen, I don't know, in jQuery. or Right, you can pass back and forth. Yeah, you can sure, that's talk nifty. in between. So that, that, is yeah, so that opens up a lot of possibilities. Now, I guess I, more I was asking about... You're saying that they're trying to roll this out the door. Maybe it's not done yet. So my thought. Well, no. The, the open slide said it was still in development. Go ahead. Right. Presentation going. My my screen shows just quick. Did it crash? It looks like. As long as it's still running. Daniel, can you hear me? I think, I think we're okay. Okay. Yes, yeah. I hear you. Yeah, he can still, yeah. So you, you were saying that uh, maybe it's still in development, but. Oh no, it is definitely still in development. Is. That was why I put the big exclamation point yeah. at the okay. beginning. So don't ask any hard questions. <laughs> so is that not a framework of C Sharp? Or is so that, that's, that's kind of where I'm going. That's what I figured. Is, is it a limited is it .NET Core? Is it, is it C so is my it? understanding is .NET Core. It's all .NET Core right now. But there, I've got more information about that here a little bit later. Gotcha. All right, so what do you need to get started? I'll just kind of click through these a little quickly because you guys you probably understand that, huh? You forgot the computer. Yeah, you need a computer, <laughs> an internet connection, an RJ45 hookup. Can I run this on that? <laughs> uh, the answer is yes. Yeah, you probably should be able to. Okay. So, it is yes. you got to have .NET Core, obviously, the specific version, Visual Studio specific version with the web development workload. You can, or you have to install the language, Blazor Language Services extension. You guys can read this. You know what I mean. So, now we're going to go into a demo. So uh, remember, we're demoing Blazor, the client side portion. And the concepts we're going to review here are routing, parameters, parent and child components, and dependency injection. All right, so I'm going to bounce out of that. We're going to go into uh, Visual Studio. And I need to move that thing there. All right, so we're going to go File and then New Project which you all have done a million times. Now, I should also say you don't have to do file new project. You can do all this from the command line if you are one of those kind of people uh, and want to be efficient. So what we're going to do is I'm going to call this So Fried uh, Blazor, okay? And we'll just put client just to be clear, even though it should already be clear. So click OK. And notice that we've got these options here. So we've got three options around Blazor. So when you look at the Blazor option, it just says a project template for creating a standalone Blazor application that runs on WebAssembly. We'll click on the other two here shortly. So I'm going to click OK. And this is where you tell jokes during the awkward silence here. What's on the board behind you? <laughs> like instructions sure. to other participants yeah, in the yeah, meeting? Yeah. Oh. So, all right, so the very first thing I'm going to do before we even like start talking about uh, project structure is I'm going to go ahead and run this. Now, I'll also say some of the things that I'm going to demo, you should just be able to refresh the browser and the changes apply or be shown. I've got some kind of issue going on with my system where I can't just refresh and I'll have to like rerun, so it, it, some of this will take a little bit of time. <laughs> 
Clint, if I'm not mistaken, those uh, project, uh, what do you call them, those, those those two projects for Blazor, you need to yeah. install an extension manually, right? It doesn't come with Visual Studio by default. Yes, I just posted them in the chat window for you. Yes, yeah, so I think um, the... The, well, the SDK as well. Yeah, the, the the items that I listed that you need to have installed so that you can develop Blazor, that installs them in the Visual Studio for you. Okay, I missed that. And if, if it doesn't, then go to the link that David's going to share off of the Blazor docs, and uh, it, it talks you through it. So, yes. all right. So we've got the SoFry Blazor client project pulled up. You can see, you know, we've got, we can click around. We've got this counter that we can click. We can fetch data, right? But what I really want to show is when I function F12 here and go to the network tab and refresh. Now, this may be a little small for you, but I want you to pay attention or at least look at what's going on here. So we've got this Blazor WebAssembly.js. If you remember in my slides, I said that, you know, they use JavaScript to bootstrap the application, right? So you've got a JavaScript file, and if you can see, we've got this mono.js, and then we've got what? That mono, which is .wasm, which is the uh, .NET uh, version or implementation of WebAssembly, the runtime, in the browser. So, you know, nobody's like hooping and hollering and clapping, but this is actually yeah. pretty big time, right? So we're able to, to run this code in the browser. So, all right, we're going to close that. And what we're going to do now is we're going to just stop running this. And we're going to look a little bit at the project structure, and then we're going to talk about uh, some components here. So um, if we look at this WW root folder, you'll see in the sample data this weather.json file. So this is where that was coming from. So this is... You know, obviously local data, but, you know, you could be hitting sure. any, any API. Um, so in the pages, notice that we've got the CSHTML file, right? So we, we kept talking about components and how a component can be a class. It can also be a CSHTML or, or CSHTML or Razor file. Uh, so this is very much like in my mind, the, the, you know, angular type field. So these are components. We can reference them. So uh, what we're going to do is we're just going to create a new, we'll, we'll actually, I guess, open up the index and look at it. You'll notice that we've got this uh, at dot page um, directive here at the top of the page. Same thing with the counter. Um, and then notice that we've got this on click. This is not a JavaScript on click. This yep. is C sharp. Yep. And then we're, we got the functions block. So we're running these C sharp functions in the browser, right? So let's get a little bit uh, crazy here. And we're going to add a new item. And so my initial thought was we would add a razor page, but that's not how it happens, at least in the demos, right? They select text file. And so we're going to create a so fry.cshtml. We've got too many M's there. All right, so we've got so fry cshtml. Um, so what we're going to do first is add that at page directive, and then we're going to call this just slash so fry. All right, I'll save that. And then we'll just come down here and uh, go a little H1. It's not giving me my IntelliSense yet, but we'll just say my SoFried component. And we'll save that, right? So we're going to go ahead and just uh, run the application again. And this is going to do exactly what you imagine it does, but we have to show it, right, to prove it. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, so we'll come here and we'll go slash SoFry. And you can see the my SoFry component, right? So just like that, we're able to create a component and then reference it, right? Pretty, pretty uh, slick stuff. So yeah. now what I want to do is we're going to add a parameter. So what we need to do is we need to add the functions block. Okay, and so then we're going to do a little shortcut. We'll type in para tab tab, and that, you know, just gets us to a parameter. So we're going to uh, create a string. We'll just call this string, 
and then we'll just refer to it as title and then we'll go ahead and set it and we'll just say my SoFried demo title right so we come up here and we'll throw a little HR and then we'll come in here and we'll just go uh, at title actually so we're setting that all right well actually I need a uh, semicolon here um, we could come in here anywhere and go at title and notice the uh, IntelliSense that we get so I'm going to save that and run it and we will probably get back to back if it works correctly so we will surf ride and see now this is not pretty but you can see what just happened right so we've got the content that I typed in but then we also have the title which was that parameter right so I'll stop this now I'm going to go back to the index page and underneath that uh, survey prompt I'll throw an HR just to give us some space and I'll start typing the letter S O and boom look what happens so we get the so fried uh, IntelliSense like it knows that there's a component called so fried right yeah so I'll go ahead and do that and then we'll run it again so this is going to be doing what it's going to show on the home page right so there it is so now we're able to reference that uh, component from the home page so now what I'm going to do is remember we created that parameter of title so if I come into this element and I start typing in the word title you see we get IntelliSense and so I'll just say new title I'll save that and then we'll run it again and it should update the title it's like black magic so now you can see my certified component with the new title added in now if we go to the slash so page you can see it, it's still set to what it was mm -hmm. right so just like you would imagine so you can get uh, pretty creative with this so uh, now I'm going to go back to the uh, counters page and we're going to just create another uh, parameter and this is what uh, Dan uh, Roth did in his uh, demo so protect it in, and we're going to change this to increment amount and then we'll set this equal to 2 and now down here instead of going plus plus we'll go plus equals and then we'll go um, 5 here um, so we've just uh, updated the or added in a new parameter here for uh, the or actually it shouldn't be plus five it should be I was ahead of myself should be plus increment amount which is the parameter I just created so uh, we just updated this and you remember we had the counter page so now on the uh, index I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna just throw in another HR for some separation we'll add in that counter and then we've got Close that we got increment amount and I will do five that's where I wanted to do the five here so this is the same same principle here as what we just showed and on the home page when we click count you can see we go 5 10 15 20 and if we go to the counter page we're still going by two right that makes sense to everybody good deal all right so now we want to talk a little bit about uh, dependency injection so oh, yeah. <laughs> when we get to the fetch data page you'll see where we've got the at page directive with the route and then we've got this at inject so we've got this HTTP client 
uh, HTTP, and as we look down the page, you can see where, uh, you know, we've got some C-sharp code uh, coming here or running here. We've got the for each, uh, but then the functions block, you can see where we've got, you know, this array of weather forecast forecasts, uh, and then we're using that uh, service that we're injecting, and we're hitting the uh, API, in this case, which is local, you know, JSON, right? And we're pulling data in. So this, uh, this, this is happening. This is dependency injection is services, right? So when we go to the startup uh, CS file, you'll notice where we have the configure services and configure. So this is like standard for any, you know, .NET Core type of app. Uh, and I believe the HTTP services is just, you know, shipped with the core, right? You don't have to add that. But if you had other services that you wanted to add, you could use those there. Now, also, I want to draw your attention to this add component app, right? So you can see, and this is, to me, also something that kind of reflects back to, you know, Angular or React, right? So if I open up the WW root folder and I look at the index.html, you'll see where we have a selector, uh, of app, right? And so it's going to say loading until it bootstraps and injects itself in there, right? Also notice we've got the script source, blazor.webassembly.js. If you remember, I said that we use that JS to bootstrap the application. So um, again, we're talking about dependency injection, but this is through, you know, these services, right? So, um, you know, you guys have seen that it, you know, puts the weather on the page, so I don't have to... Uh, you know, review that um, with you. So uh, it is pretty neat, though, and I, and I love how it's all modular and, you know, components. So now what I want to talk about uh, is the parent and child components. So I'm going to go back to the uh, certify page. Nesting-wise, or uh, what do you mean? I don't know. You said that you can nest these. Uh, that's yeah. That's what you mean by parent and child? It's nesting, or? Yeah, so you'll see it, but basically... A parent, the parent-child component allows you to set the content for one component from another component, right? Um, and so it leverages this uh, property called child content. And so in this functions block, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to do para, tab, tab. Uh, but we're going to make this a private. And instead of an int, we're going to make it a render fragment. So it's got to be a render fragment. Uh, and we're we need to call it child content, right? So we've got that child content, and I'm going to come here, and I'm just going to put um, put it in italics. So we'll reference the child content so that any content we put in here uh, should be italicized, right? So on the uh, do what or emphasized? Well, emphasized, yeah. <laughs> so we we've got this. Uh, on the index page, I just went back to the, now, and I guess I should ask, is that code readable? Should I zoom in for people? Uh, just a touch was helpful. Touch, okay, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm, I'm always the guy that says, hey, zoom in. So we just updated the SoFry component, right? I added in this uh, property of child content, which was a render fragment, and, you know, we referenced it up here. Uh, now, back on the index, you know, I'm, I'm calling that component here. So what I'm going to do in between the brackets is I'm just going to say Chile Child Content, right? So we'll save that, and then we will run it. So does anybody have a guess on what this is going to make happen? It's going to make it cold. <laughs> it's going to make it pop. <laughs> it's probably an error out. All right, so check this out. We're on the home page, the index. And you can see this chili child content that I just uh, put here, but this is being set by the parent component. So in the index razor file, we called the SoFry component, and then we put this uh, content in between the brackets, which is that child content, and it is emphasized, David, or italicized because <laughs> we put it there. So pretty powerful once you, um, you know, start thinking about the possibilities there. Now, so I started asking myself the question, well, can I put a component inside of another component? Can I, like, how deep can I go, right? So as long as you have child content, then you can uh, add more content or more components to it, which is what I 
uh, experience. Is SoFi in there? Yeah, so, well, we're, we already referenced SoFi, so we'll just do that fetch data, which is the weather. Yeah. Well, actually, I should stop that first and make sure that's saved. Um, so I don't know all the answers to this one, but I will say it, from what I've seen is if you have that child content property, then you can nest the components. Mm -hmm. If you don't, then it will error. So see how we now have the weather forecast, but it is taking on the italicized or inside, oh. <laughs> you know, so you can put that inside of it. So I haven't tried to go three deep with it yet. Maybe we should, but I doubt it would work if the fetch data didn't have that child content property, right? So I uh, haven't tried to blow it up too much. But these demos here are, are pretty basic in nature, right? But you start to see like how you could very easily organize, you know, uh, an application. And you, for me, I'm thinking like in the DNN world, I can have a component for my menu or maybe for my login or, you know, for whatever it may be. Um, but again, it's pretty powerful. So, um, I want to kind of transition a little bit. When we build these Blazor uh, applications, this the result of the Blazor project is just a bunch of static files. So that means you could host that app anywhere that supports static file hosting. So it doesn't have to be .NET on the server, right? Because again, these are static files. However, it gets interesting when we do choose to host uh, a Blazor app on a server that is running uh, .NET. So what I'm going to do now is close this Which solution. .NET is running? That's going to be .NET Core. .NET Core. So we're going to go new project again. Will it run in framework? In a little bit. Hold on. Sorry. Don't be derailing me now. Sorry, I mean, I, I'm, on a, I'm on a mission here. <laughs> well, so we're going to call this Blazor. Uh, ASP.NET uh, Core hosted. All right, so we're going to click OK. Now we'll click the second option here, which says a project template for creating a Blazor application that runs on WebAssembly and is hosted on an ASP.NET Core server. So I'm not going to go through the entire like component, you know, everything that we just did. Uh, because I think you guys understand that. But what I will do is uh, run it, first of all, just to show you that it'll run. But then we're going to talk about the project structure. So if you'll notice over here on the right-hand side, we've got three projects, right? So i let this pull up here. But the thing that's awesome is that whether you're doing it just on the client and it's the, the static files or you're doing it on the server, the component model stays the same, right? So if we look at the network tab and we refresh, uh, you can see that, you know, we've got the same files that we talked about earlier, but now we've got some more Microsoft stuff getting included here. So I point that out to simply uh, share the information that now, if you run it in a, a .NET Core hosted environment, you can leverage all the goodness, the .NET goodness that you're used to, right? So notice in the clients that, you know, all this stuff is pretty much the same. we still got the same components, uh, and, but then you've got the server portion here, and this is used to host the output of the Blazor uh, project, Notice that we've got this controller folder, right? So the sample data here where we were pulling in, uh, you know, weather data on that JSON file, now they're just uh, creating it randomly here in this um, uh, code file here. Um, but, you know, again, you're starting to be able to leverage the skill sets that you already have, which points back to the PowerPoint that we mentioned earlier. And then you've got uh, the shared. So what is shared across both sides of the wire? And here, you know, you've just got this, this weather um, <laughs> forecast. So do you guys get the sense or the feel of fullstack.net web development yet? Is it starting to click a little bit? You don't have to answer if we're going back to slides. <laughs> well, hey, I will, uh, I will throw in some of the comments that have come in from the I'm not done yet. But oh, no, I know. We're throwing some of the comments that have come in from chat. Uh, you know, uh, there have been quotes like, uh, yeah, I haven't looked at this yet, but it's the most exciting new technology I've seen in a while. You know? Southerners uh, we, can do it. <laughs> we, we've got, uh, you know, I'm so excited I'm like a bull in a china store. You know, we, we've got these 
Yeah. People excited uh, kind of comments. Kid going on. Nice. Kid before Christmas. All right, so, so one of them. We're or somebody else. We are. Oh, we're both somebody. <laughs> so we're going to transition now to server side Blazor, which is called Razor Components. So this is a picture of a blog from Visual Studio Magazine, and I have again excerpted some text from this that I will read, right? So this is Dan Roth, ASP.NET Program Manager talking, and he says, the primary goal remains to shift support for running Blazor client-side in the browser. Work on Blazor client-side on WebAssembly will continue in parallel with Razor Components work, i.e. Blazor on the server, Although it will remain experimental, Ryan, still in development, experimental, mm -hmm. uh, while we work through the issues of running .NET on WebAssembly. We will, however, keep the component model the same regardless of whether you're running on the server or the client. So not again, a special version. Yeah, if you're not making a special version, if you can code it on the server, you can do it on the client, right? Again, the C-sharp devs rejoicing. Now, it says you can, or he noted that you can switch your Blazor app to run on the client by changing one line of code. It's actually two lines, and I'm going to show you how to do that, but it, it like kind of blows your mind, right? But the big news was that the Blazor component model is included in ASP.NET Core 3.0, so it's, it's going to ship, and they named it Razor Components to differentiate it from the ability to run .NET in the browser. So, you know, these terminologies, they kind of like start blending together. So, Blazor is basically .NET on the client. And then Razor Components is Blazor on the server. All right. Is that Razor Pages? Nope. <laughs> so to continue, when we talk about Razor Components, which again is server-side Blazor, what's going to happen is when you make the initial request, your browser is going to download that index.html file, and it's going to use the small JavaScript file, which we already saw, right? But this time it's called blazor.server.js. Bonus points for anybody who remembers what it was called in the first one. No oh, sorry, what did you say? You missed it. I was. Uh, I, I, just, it was you, a, wait, wait, I injected wait, wait, a trivia wait, wait, wait. quiz. I saw you typing and I asked a question. Yeah, because I was thinking about. I saw Signal R there. I was going to type that Chris Hammond ought to be happy. Yeah, he should. Uh, yeah. He should. So. Anyways, it uses JavaScript to bootstrap the application, and then it establishes a connection from your browser to the server using Signal R. Shout out to Brady Gaster, right? He's on the Signal R team. Cool. So a visual representation of this: you've got your browser, you've got your you know index.html, which calls that uh, JS file, which then creates that Signal R connection to the server. So what then happens is the server is going to execute the component logic server side, and it's going to produce some HTML. That's going to be compared on the server to what is currently on the DOM on the client. And then it's going to, you know, from that comparison, it's going to, the changes that need to be made to the DOM are then, are then produced. They're packaged up, sent to the browser via that signal R connection. And then once they're in the browser, they're unpackaged and applied to the DOM, right? So it's kind of like a constant comparison, like what needs to change? Oh, this is different. Let's send it, and uh, you're going to get a lot of good performance out of this. So keep in mind, the, the Blazor on the client, they're still working on that. That's kind of like in experimental phase. But this right here is shipping with ASP.NET uh, Core 3.0. So I do need to give a shout-out to Chris Sainty, I think. Sainty is how you say it. Uh, that blog was worthy of sainthood, so we'll just call him Sainty if that's not how you say it. Um, but this blog, and I think Sean Walker even, uh, I saw this blog because Sean Walker like retweeted it or something. Um, I think he may have posted on LinkedIn, actually. But anyways, this blog is one of the few blogs that talks about Blazor on the server side. You know, Most of the information you'll find is Blazor on the client, but this one is specifically about Razor components. And he makes, uh, uh, or he gives a lot of great information, but I extracted this one quote, and it says, the great thing about Blazor's architecture is its flexibility. Flexibility being a word that people often use to describe DNN, right? 
Then he goes on to say that it has the ability to separate the execution of a Blazor application from the rendering process, and that opens up a lot, a mass of possibilities for application development. So you guys who are much more senior to me in development and the guys on the meeting here, I'm sure your mind is spinning, right? And that's exactly uh, what uh, Chris is saying here. So shout out to Chris for that block. Now, so we're going to do a demo of Razor Components. Uh, it's going to be very quick. All we're going to do is look at the project structure. We're going to get kind of a brief, you know, hey, look at how fast this happened. And then we're going to change this to a client-side app by updating just a few lines of code. See, okay. It was already running as a client-side app. Now you're going to turn it to a server-side app. I'm going to create a server-side Razor Components oh, app, you swap. and then I'm going to okay. swap it. Okay, swap it like it's hot. All right, so we will <laughs> close this solution, and we'll go new. Ah, come on, mouse. New project. So this one we'll call this So Fried Razor Component Demo. All right, so we will click OK, and as you would imagine, we're going to click the third option, which is server side in ASP.NET Core. And you can, you know, read the explanation we're running at server side. All right, so notice the project structure on this one. We've got uh, demo.app and demo.server. And if you look at the uh, you know, structure, again, you've got the components. Notice we've got the services here. So this is, again, the weather forecast, weather forecast service, creating that data for the fetch data. So uh, the structure is similar, but they're changing it based on which project type we create. So let's go ahead and run this project. And the first thing that we should notice, if everything goes right, is how fast that loaded in comparison to the other, right? Yeah. So again, if we click, you know, we've got our little counter. It seems, it seems, yeah, I was going to actually say, seeing that it's running local, the delay that we had on the other one is actually kind of a, a concern or a thought. If it took that long so, to run local, right, but, but this was instantly faster. So they, that is that is true. Um, but what they would say, if you like, when we looked in the console and the network tab, yep. all the stuff that was downloaded currently, I, I can't remember what it was. It was some initially it was 60k. Yeah, and in the end, when Dan was talking in his demo, he's like, we're working on getting that lower. We you know we want to make that better. But again, because of mono. Because of mono. Bigger. That's right. And and that's why they're stripping out any parts that you're not using to, to get you better load time. Um, but it's they're working to make it more performant. But again, remember, you're loading the .NET mm -hmm. runtime in the browser, right? If we function F12, uh, this one, if I can do that and move this little gadget here, uh, and refresh, notice how many files get loaded. Not many at all, right? So that's why you have a lot better performance uh, on this one. And again, you know, the model's the same from the, you know, client to, to the, uh, the server. So, all right, I'm going to stop that now. I'm going to come into the, what we're going to do is we're going to take the server side app and then we're going to turn it into a client side app. So I'm going to go into this uh, startup.cs file and I'm just going to take this line here and we're going to copy it and then we're going to paste it and then I'm going to comment this one now. And instead of saying use server side blazer, anybody want to guess what we're going to say? We're just going to say use Blazor. Okay. Now back on that index HTML. So this was the trivia question that I asked David. That you and I'll go ahead and comment that out. Yep. So instead of saying framework Blazor dot server dot js, what are we going to say? Blazor dot web assembly dot js. Right. So now we're going to run this. So I don't know that you would ever like have a purpose or reason to do this, but it is pretty cool that you can do it. So the app loaded up, it didn't crash, and if we F12 it and refresh it again, now watch how many files get loaded uh, into the browser. So you see the difference, right? So 
it's pretty cool that you can do that. I mean, I'm guessing that if you had like enterprise application, you know, you would probably run it, you know, Razor component server side so you could get a performance and all the .NET goodness that you would anticipate. But again, you don't have to. All right, so we made it through the demo portion without any terrible issues that I recall. And so now I'm going to go back to uh, so the slide. So benefits, uh, you get Razor Component server-side Blazor benefits. You get access to all the .NET Core APIs that you're used to. You get that spa-like feel to a server-side app, which is pretty impressive, right? There's, there's not page refreshes. It's very smooth. You know, you get a rich uh, feel. Smaller download than the client-side Blazor, what we just pointed out. You get a wider range of clients, uh, for example, IoT devices or watches or whatever it may be, right? So you don't have the requirement of WebAssembly on the server. The debugging story for Razor Components is currently better than the debugging story for Blazor on the client side, and that's currently they're working on it. And again, it's easy to switch to a client side app if you need to. All right, so terminology review, because we're having a test shortly. He? Razor is the programming syntax that Andrew Heffling loves that is used to create dynamic web pages with C Sharp and VB.net. Blazor is running Razor on the client, and that's possible via WebAssembly. Blazor components are the building blocks for a Blazor application, those CS or CSHTML files. And Razor components is Blazor on the server. Now, the fun part, Blazor and DNN. What could Blazor and Razor Components or Blazor and or Razor Components mean to DNN, right? What if DNN fully embraced Blazor? Could we potentially be the example use case? Would it, uh, help, would it help attract new talent if we align our roadmap with Microsoft's strategic direction? So here's your question, David. Once we move to .NET standard, well, you keep asking about it. <laughs> Once we move to uh, .NET standard, which is slated for DNN 10, then using these Blazor components should become a possibility, right? Well, I thought you said it run on .NET Core. It does run on .NET Core, but .NET Core or .NET standard. Well, .NET standard. That's why. <laughs> that's why I told you to wait. <laughs> you ask him here, and, and the project I'll just, I'll just I'll just I'll just I know you're trying to stop me. That's why I'm trying to get you to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! What, uh, so, in, in a naive way, uh, one thing that I'm losing track of is understanding the difference of how we would implement Blazor versus Razor or Razor Pages in that they seem very similar in the result of what we get out of them. Are you saying Razor Pages or Razor Components? Yeah, which one are you I don't about? know the difference between those two. Yeah, okay, two because, different worlds. Yeah, that's two yeah. different things. That's Razor why we did a terminology pages, review. And it's confusing because they're both ba based on the Razor syntax. Right, right. right. Yeah. That's the only thing that's real. So, well, so Razor Pages but, has a has a Razor file, CSA HTML file, mm -hmm. just like this does. Right. But it also has a front end piece of that as well. So it's kind of like the old web forms model where you have a, a AFCS controller, an ASPX page, and a code behind. Well, so, that's a that's sort of so in, in the sense model. that those two are similar. Does Blazor is Blazor a more simple, pure, just your .NET by itself? You're loading it up and you go. And Razor components then? Or pages? That's Which one was it? Razor then has other stuff that it brings to the table, and if we're just looking for simplicity of the pure, we go with Blazor? So you've got Razor, which is the syntax. You've got Razor Pages, Razor pages which is a different model. Razor Components is Blazor yeah, on the server. So, oh, right, no, I, I was here for that. Okay, yeah, no, I mean... Um, so Blazor is component-based, whereas right. Razor Pages... Razor, I don't mean Razor component Components. Based. Uh, the, in, in this conversation, I'm thinking of Razor Components and Blazor being the two sides of the same coin. One of them is client-side and one of them is server-side. Which side. is correct. So we're talking about that as being a thing that we can work towards, 
However, we were kind of talking about razor pages right. in previous conversations. That's right. Saying that that's a good method yeah. to get it so, heading in direction, but your laser seems like a better uh, direction. So, so you, you're right in that we uh, were talking, and Andrew Heflin started the prototype on yeah. razor pages as a potential like stepping stone yeah. to get to .NET Core. So that that is all correct. But now with the uh, knowledge or adoption finding out of adoption of Blazor, we are not pursuing the Razor Pages uh, method. And because it's implied that yeah. Microsoft okay. is not. So that was kind of my question. Was that if this has been decided, and the and the well, technology group has no. basically said we're going to debate, or no. we're still talking theoreticals and concepts of what might be best. Because everything is kind of still in development. I, nobody would say, "Oh, this has been 100 percent decided." Right. But if you took a poll, you'd probably have more people leaning this way right now. I get it. I, I can see, I, I'm not a developer at that level at all. I can see the purity of this, yeah. and this is very interesting to me. Yeah. yeah. All right, so uh, continuing on here with the slides, I'm trying yeah, to be yeah. mindful of Mike's yeah, milk. Yeah, Mike, Mike, Mike we're, we're, we're not forgetting about you. We're yeah. excited. You're coming on. So what if then developers could leverage the power of Blazor for their extensions, whether that be themes or modules or whatever it may be? Would it streamline development efforts? Could it make us potentially drop dependencies on so many JS libraries? And could extensions be Blazor or Razor components? Can we say bye-bye to jQuery? <laughs> yeah, that'd be a good question. So uh, could Razor components offer a compelling story to be in an as a platform, core platform, and or to extension developers? So those are questions that I have that we can discuss. Relevant links, blazer.net, we should actually go there. We will. But also this, uh, well, it, it went there. Hold on. Uh, that was the second link here, which is this one. Um, the YouTube video of Dan Roth, who is walking through. So basically, the presentation I gave is uh, what Dan did here. This is just me mimicking him, right? Um, and then the blog by Chris Sainty. I do want to go to the blazer.net site and click on this community tab. They've got good docs, APIs, all that. But notice uh, what's going on here. So there is a community. Ryan, notice the unsupported experimental web framework. Um, but notice you've got all this stuff happening, people building stuff up, samples, tutorials, uh, you know, tooling, community documentation. There's this Learn Blazor website. Uh, David Poindexter, you've got an Ionic jacket on. What about <laughs> Bionic? Blazor Ionic. Yeah, <laughs> an Ionic CLI clone for Blazor project. So, uh, you guys, this, this stuff is very simple. A lot of you guys here are much more my senior uh, in development. And, you know, to me, this is pretty, pretty compelling. I encourage you to click through some of this stuff. Uh, look at these. I think I saw something about a site core or something somewhere in here. Somebody, yeah, so yeah. like we need to throw some DNN love in here. Um, Absolutely. It may have been on that Learn Blazor site. I can't remember. But anyway, they've got good information here, good tutorials, getting started, like building your first app. I mean, this is basically what we just walked through, except you've got the southern version of it. So um, that is my presentation, and if you have any questions, snide remarks, comments, jokes, we're open to them, but I do really, I mean, honestly, guys, I, I think that Blazor could be uh, a pretty big piece of the future uh, if we embrace it, and I think Microsoft's going to embrace it, and uh, I would love to see DNN, you know, really grab it by the horns and, and go, so... Any any questions or do we are we pressed for time? We need to get the mic. We're we're pressed for time. We need okay. to we need to move on. All right. Um, Sorry, Mike. I apologize. This is exciting. Um, yeah, this is what you didn't wear a blazer. Well, uh, I wear the market so I can a good look. Yeah. And yeah. normally I put on my my hat during the demo portion. Yeah. It's yeah. A channel, but yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I did drive a blazer in high school. At that oh, point. well, that's something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um. So, Clint, I'm gonna look for um. I'm going to look for slide deck and maybe links to uh, resources and things like that, so we'll put them into our, our SoCry uh, write-up uh, when we're posting the video online and everything. Um, I would imagine that let's turn this into something, you know, two, two um, sessions from now and four sessions from now. Let's 
Let's do a little recap. Maybe we bring some things and put some stuff up on um, Microsoft blogs and get some people paying attention to what DNN is doing with Blazor. We, yeah, I mean, we look, create some buzz in the other direction. It would be neat. 